Please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Mark 11, 1 through 11. Today's Palm Sunday, and so I thought it would be appropriate for us to look at this passage in order to better prepare us for Friday, the cross, and then, of course, next Sunday, the resurrection. What a great day that's going to be. Now, the Gospel of Mark was written to give us a true and accurate picture of Jesus. And he shows us that Jesus is the Lord God Almighty in human flesh who came to seek and to save the lost. In the first 10 chapters, Mark showed us that Jesus is indeed both a 100% man and 100% God at the same time. That Jesus is the one in authority and everything, even nature and even demons, obey his commands. And look, here's the good news, that because of who Jesus is and because of what he will soon do on the cross for everyone who believes, he can rescue your soul from the death grip of the wicked one, and he can save your soul from eternal wrath by grace through faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. And Mark shows us those incredible eternal truths. And the real question is, how will you respond to Christ? Now, at this point in chapter 11, Jesus is now making his way to Jerusalem where the cross looms large. In the previous passage, Jesus healed a blind man in Jericho, and now we find him coming to the end of his nearly, uh, that nearly 18-mile dangerous 4,000-foot uphill climb from Jericho up to Jerusalem. Let's find out what happens. Verse 1. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, and so they let them go. We'll stop here for now, and here in today's passage, we find seven facts for us to take note of. And the first fact is this, that Jesus and the twelve drew near Jerusalem. Now remember, Jerusalem wasn't just any old city. No, no, not at all. Jerusalem was clearly the most important city in the Bible. And after David died and after the temple was built... Jerusalem became the great center of all civil and all religious affairs for the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. See, Jerusalem was where the temple was at. This is where the worship of the one true God was centralized. This is where God's manifest presence was. And this really was the center of everything for the people of God. And now, Jesus and his disciples are making their way into this most amazing city, the question is why? I mean, Jesus has been waiting on the other side of the Jordan River down near Jericho for quite a while, but now it's time for him to come into Jerusalem. So again, why now? Here's why. Because it was Passover. Other gospels make it clear that Jesus has been planning things this way for nine months, ministering to many people along the way, yes, but clearly making sure that they end up in Jerusalem during Passover, which is what happens. Let me, rem let me remind you that the Passover was the greatest of the three great annual festivals for the Jews. If you remember, the Passover goes way back to the book of Exodus when the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt. And look, in order for the Jews to be freed from their hundreds of years of bondage, God brought nine plagues onto the Egyptians, with the tenth plague being the death of the firstborn, Passover. Now, in order for the Jews to be saved from this horrible tenth plague, a lamb with no defects had to be killed, and its blood had to be smeared on the door frames of each Israelite home. And if the blood of the lamb was applied to the door frames, then the Lord would pass over those homes and spare them from death. And so, while all Israel mourned because so many had died from this horrible plague, the Israelites not only survived the plague, but they were freed, not only from death, but also from their bondage in Egypt. And so, Every year, they celebrated this great event, Passover. Now, 
during this time, the city of Jerusalem was flooded with people who were celebrating this great festival. See, three times a year, Passover being one of those times, the Jews were supposed to make their way into Jerusalem, where they would then celebrate and worship God in the temple. During Passover, they would celebrate together. They would slaughter their Passover lambs as a reminder of what God had done. And then they would worship the Lord for his great deliverance of his people. And doesn't it make sense that Jesus died during Passover? How ironic, right? 1 Corinthians 5, 7 talks about Christ, our Passover. And just as the blood of the Passover lamb saved the Israelites from death, so too does the blood of the perfect Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, allow us who believe to be saved from eternal death, to be passed over in the judgment, to be forgiven and to be delivered of all our sin. So it makes sense that Jesus had to be in Jerusalem at this time. And now the stage is set. Passover is just a few days away. And therefore, the city was crowded. It was noisy. People were literally everywhere. And it's in this environment that Jesus enters into Jerusalem on this Sunday morning before his death. Now, please note that not only was the city crowded for Passover, but it wasn't long ago. And in a town nearby that Jesus had raised Lazarus up from the dead. And undoubtedly, the people were talking about that incredible event. Undoubtedly, the expectations for Jesus at this time were extremely high. This is our Messiah. Jesus is the one. Jesus is indeed our conquering king, and it's time for him to act like our Messiah, like our conquering king. And that was the idea on the minds of the people at this time, as we will see. Note that the prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah, the Christ, the coming deliverer, spoke of both a suffering servant and a conquering king, Messiah. And as the people of Christ's day were being oppressed by the Romans, they were eagerly looking for their conquering king, Messiah, deliverer. See, they didn't want spiritual deliverance. No, they wanted physical deliverance, even though spiritual deliverance is much better, and even though spiritual deliverance lasts much longer. But no, they wanted conquest. They wanted national freedom and power. They wanted a ruler to come along and to stomp out the Romans. And here Jesus is. And he seems like the Messiah. But up until this point, there was still much confusion about Jesus. Why? Because as one said, he's meek and lowly and humble and submissive. And he pays taxes to Rome. And he's hated by the leaders of Israel. And it's so not what they had expected. You know that even John the Baptist was confused about this at one point. Cousin John John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus the Messiah, the cousin of Jesus. John pointed others to Christ saying, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And yet even then, he got confused. See, he was put into prison by Herod and things just didn't look right to John. And so he sent some of his followers who came to Jesus and said, we want to know whether you're the Messiah. Or should we look for someone else? Isn't that incredible? Jesus eased his worry on that issue, but it seems clear that while John and his disciples knew that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God, they still vacillated because Jesus did things so differently from what they had expected. We believe you're the Messiah, but we don't remotely understand the plan. Why aren't you taking charge? Why aren't you leading a revolution? Why are you conquering like we thought you were going to do? Here's why. Because their expectations were wrong. And while the next time that he comes, he will indeed be that conquering king, Messiah. Can't wait for that. <laughs> the first time he came was to be our suffering servant who will lay down his life to bring spiritual and eternal deliverance for his needy, desperate, lost people, which is far, far, far better. That's not what they wanted. That's not what they expected either. And all the while, here's Jesus and he knows what's coming and he's walking right into it. He knows that 
The people's expectations of him are going to be crushed. He knows that these crowds are going to turn on him and mock him and cheer on his death. He knows that on Thursday night and Friday that he's going to suffer more than any human has ever suffered in the history of the world. And as he takes on not just horrible physical brutality, but also as he faces spiritual wrath against our sin as believers, our sin, he knows. But he still walks on. What an amazing God we have. Second, look, verse 1 says that they now drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. And at this point, Jesus was about two miles outside of Jerusalem on the southeastern slope of the Mount of Olives, the other side of the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. What do we know about the Mount of Olives? Well, in the Old Testament, the Mount of Olives is mentioned once in relation to King David. When David's son Absalom wrested control of Jerusalem, David and his loyal followers fled the city the same way that Jesus is now entering into it. 2 Samuel 15.30 says, David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. Later on, King Solomon used the Mount of Olives for idol worship. On a hill east of Jerusalem, the Mount of Olives, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites, 1 Kings 11.7. Also, in one of Ezekiel's visions, the prophet sees the glory of the Lord depart from Jerusalem and come to rest above the mountain east of it, the Mount of Olives, Ezekiel eleven twenty three. We also know from the Gospels that Jesus made many visits here while he was in Jerusalem, that it was a significant place during the last week of Christ's earthly life. And also, as Acts 1, 12 says, the top of this mount is a place where Jesus ascended into heaven. And then according to the prophet Zechariah, Jesus will return not only to the same place, but also in the same manner. As Zechariah 14.4 says in a prophecy related to the end times, says this, that on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half the mountain moving north and half the mountain moving south. So again, this is a very significant place. And so, On the other side of the Mount of Olives sits a garden of Gethsemane, and that garden gives you a great view of the city of Jerusalem. Bethany's on the other side of the Mount of Olives, and as Jesus drew near these suburbs of Jerusalem, Bethphage and Bethany on the other side of the Mount of Olives, he sends two of his disciples ahead of him, probably to the village of Bethphage, to get a colt that had never been ridden for him to ride into the city upon. So Jesus says, go get that colt. And if anyone says, why are you doing this? Why are you loosing it? Then you respond by saying, because the Lord needs it. Now, obviously, something supernatural is going on here for Jesus to know about that colt and then for the owners to know to let the disciples take that colt. But what I love about this is that they went. I mean, this couldn't have been easy for them to go and to do. Picture them as they hurried ahead to the next village. And then as they entered into the village and they see a colt tied there, what do they do? They go up to it. It's not theirs. They go up to it and they begin untying it. Now think about that. I mean, this is real faith, right? This is real obedience. But they knew Jesus and they trusted Jesus. See, And if he says it's okay, then it must be okay. So they obey. Hey, what are you guys doing? Loosing... (laughs) loosing my coal. Well, the Lord has need of it. Well, okay then. So off they go. And that's the third fact from this passage. The disciples obeyed. And I just wanted to make sure we hit on that just a bit. Look, they did exactly what Christ commanded them to do. They didn't make excuses. They didn't waver when they got to where the cult was at. They didn't try to reinterpret his words to them. No, instead they they obeyed and they simply trusted the Lord with the outcome. Hey, their obedience could have gotten them into great trouble, but still they obeyed. Their obedience had to have been very uncomfortable for them, but still they obeyed. And they are examples to us because When times like that come, many waver. Isn't that true? People, yeah, many obey God when it's easy, but they compromise the minute things get hard. 
They obey God when it's comfortable, but they make excuses when things get a little uncomfortable. They obey when there's no cost to the obedience, but when there's a cost, they turn and run the other way. Many do that, but not the disciples here. See, if we love and trust God, then we will obey God more and more and more. And sometimes that obedience will be tough, it'll be costly, and it might even be painful, but the call remains the call nonetheless as followers of Christ are deliver to do what God tells us as he tells us when he tells us because he tells us and that's not always easy but it's important for us as lovers of our good God to know and to understand Spurgeon said obedience is the hallmark of faith he's right Sinclair Ferguson said that to be obedient even when you don't know where your obedience may lead you. And that's absolutely right. So you obey because he's worthy of your obedience. And then as John Calvin said, no man will actually obey God, but the one that loves God. And that's the real reason why these disciples obeyed. They believed him, they loved him, they trusted him. And even though they didn't know what was gonna happen to them, they still obeyed him and we do well to do the same as followers of God. Notice one more thing before we move on. The Lord has need of it. Isn't that interesting? The Lord has need of it. Hey, when did God ever need anything? Right. Only when he took on human flesh. And that's the incredible paradox of our Lord's earthly life. He was rich, and yet he became poor. He owned all things, and yet he possessed nothing. He created the stars, and yet he had nowhere to lay his head. He fashioned everything that there is out of nothing, yet he had to borrow a boat so that he could preach the gospel from it. He created every drop of water that exists in the world, yet he cried, I thirst, as he was dying on the cross. He created every tree, but he died on a piece of wood that he created. He created every rock, but he had to borrow a tomb in which to be buried. He used the clouds as his chariots, yet here he had to borrow a donkey on which to ride. What a paradox. What a God. And look, he did all this to save us from the wrath that we all rightfully deserve. And if that doesn't spit, spark something in your heart, then nothing will. Look at what he did for us when he took on human flesh to rescue us from the fires of hell. Incredible. We're going to look at that a little bit more on Friday. Fourth, look, Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem, verses 7 through 11. Let's look. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all the things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Isn't that interesting? I mean, why did Jesus need that colt, specifically a young colt? Why not just walk into Jerusalem? Here's why. Because over 500 years earlier, Zechariah had prophesied that the Messiah, the Deliverer, would come riding on the foal of a donkey. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And in doing this, Jesus was indeed identifying himself as the Messiah. Look what happened. The disciples returned with the donkey. And then they put their outer garments over the donkey in the place of a saddle. Jesus then climbed onto the back of the donkey and he started down the mountain, the Mount of Olives, on that donkey. And please note that the way down from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem is steep. It's very, very steep. See, to get to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, you first have to go way, way down the Mount of Olives into the Kidron Valley, and then you have to go back up into Jerusalem. And it's not an easy walk, but of course, Jesus didn't do this because it was a hard 
walk for him to take. Not at all. He did it to fulfill that prophecy, and he did it to announce who he truly is. He is the Messiah. He is the deliverer. And here in this, we see a humble man on the back of a humble beast making a humble declaration of his true identity. So here he comes, riding down the Mount of Olives on a donkey. Fifth, the people acknowledged Jesus as their Messiah. Yes, they definitely did. Look what happened. Jesus is riding on that colt into Jerusalem, as the prophecy says, and that's when the people then begin to spread their garments out on the ground, which is a gesture of reverence. See, this was an act of great respect. It was an act that was reserved only for the highest form of royalty. And here the crowds are doing this for Jesus. The thought, the Messiah has come. Mark tells us that they also cut down some leafy branches, palm branches from trees, and then they spread those branches out on the road. And this act was very significant because for about two centuries before this point in time, Palm branches had become a national symbol that signaled the hope that the Messiah would come and free Israel from its bondage. And in doing this, the people were showing very clearly, they were showing their belief in Jesus as their Messiah, as their deliverer. Finally, look, on top of everything else, verse 9 says that the whole multitude of followers cried out. Luke's account says that they began to rejoice and praise God for all the mighty works that they had seen. What a day. I mean, imagine being there. What a celebration. Hosanna, blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Try to picture being there. Talk about exciting. Talk about emotional. Talk about high, extremely high expectations. It's coming. Great excitement. The Messiah is here. Wonder what's coming next. Picture Jesus riding on that colt, fulfilling the prophecy, the crowds, the throngs of people lining the streets, shouting, praising God, laying down their garments, grabbing up those palm branches. It's an amazing event. And so again, in the people's minds, this was it. They knew that Jesus was going to go into Jerusalem, proclaim himself as the Messiah, and then begin his messianic conquering reign again. This was it. Don't you wonder who was in the crowd that day? I would imagine that the once blind Bartimaeus is there since he followed Jesus after Jesus healed him not long before. I would also imagine that many other people that Jesus had healed were in the crowd that day for Passover there in Jerusalem. And it's certainly an incredible celebration as people from all over are entering into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover later on that week. Look at this. Hosanna, which originally meant save we pray, but later would become an exclamation of praise. Perhaps the people meant in saying this, save we pray from our Roman oppressors. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a clear recognition that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Psalm 118, 26. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. See, the Messiah will come from the line of David. And again, clearly they thought that the kingdom promised to David's son was now about to be set up with Christ sitting on a throne in this messianic ruling kingdom. And again, the point is clear. Jesus is the one. He's the Messiah. He's the deliverer. He's it. And today is the day that it begins for him. And today's the day that it begins for us. Now, Mark doesn't relate this, but Luke tells us that the Pharisees are very, very upset about this whole thing. And they want Jesus to tell his followers to stop doing what they're doing. But look, Jesus tells them that if these people stop, then the very rocks would cry out. In other words, prophecy is being fulfilled and Jesus is indeed the Messiah and no one can stop that. But here's a question. Why did Jesus let this happen? It's very interesting. All this fanfare, all this pomp, why? I mean, it's not like him to do so. Here's why. I mean, up in Galilee, he, he, he with, didn't want to draw the big crowds. He went to other places where the crowds were not. Why now? Here's why. 
He did it to force the Jewish religious leaders to act during Passover when it was ordained that he should die. See, Jesus, when he rode into the city on that Sunday, Palm Sunday today, he proclaimed his kingship. Oh, yes, he did. But he also signed his own death warrant because now, and he knows it, he now, he's not hiding it for its time. And now the religious leaders who wanted him dead a long time ago, they're going to now make sure that that becomes a reality. Why did they want Jesus dead? Well, for a number of bad reasons. First, they were jealous of Jesus. And jealousy is a wicked sin. See, when Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, it meant that his authority outweighed their authority. And they hated that. Also, the attention that Jesus was getting brought out the leader's hatred and jealousy so much so that they wanted him to die. The people wanted to follow them. Uh, they, they wanted all the people to follow them, not someone else. They, the people followed Jesus around and, and not them. They didn't like that at all. They liked the approval of men, so they wanted to kill Jesus. Second, the deeds of Jesus angered the religious leaders. He healed people. But rather than believe Jesus to be the Messiah, they attributed Jesus' power to the devil. How do you deal with spiritual blindness like that? Clearly, Jesus was of God based on what he said and based on what he did. And they turned it around and said the opposite about him. It all reveals their wicked hearts. And because Satan opposes God and the people of God, the Pharisees also opposed Jesus, who is clearly God. Third, Jesus was a threat to their religious system. He pointed out their hypocrisy and they hated him even more because of it. He was exposing their hearts, see, and rather than repenting and being saved, they grew harder and they opposed him even more. Fourth, Jesus was a threat to their way of life. See, they were, uh, there were political reasons that the religious leaders wanted Jesus dead because of the unstable situation between the Jews and the Romans. If Jesus was the Messiah who would lead in a rebellion against Rome, which was the thought of the day, then that would ruin their own power within the current system. We can't have that. So let's kill Jesus so we can stay in power. Fifth, Jesus offended the prideful religious leaders because he ate and drank with sinners. So when Jesus kept company with these individuals like us, it infuriated the proud Pharisees and other religious rulers. Six, Jesus disregarded their man-made religious traditions that they exalted even above what the word of God clearly said. See, it was all external to them. It was a show. It wasn't real. They were frauds. They were fakes. And while they held their traditions legalistically, their hearts were cold and hard and wicked. So Jesus exposed their hearts by not honoring their traditions and they hated him for it and they wanted him to die for it. And Mark 3 it was after Jesus broke one of their sinful, made-up traditions that they first began to plot to have Jesus killed. In the end, they wanted Jesus dead because they were wicked and they opposed God and the things of God, even though they were very spiritual, even though they wore a religious mask. See, it was their hypocrisy, their pride, their arrogance that caused them to bring Jesus before Pilate to be crucified. They didn't want to hear the truth of God. Therefore, they wanted Jesus to die. But the crowds that day, they're all in, right? They're acknowledging Jesus as the Messiah. They're all in, right? <laughs> Wrong. They, as a whole, are no better than the religious leaders as a whole. So six, the people were false worshipers. Question, is it possible to worship Jesus and be a false worshiper even as you worship Jesus? Is it possible to worship the right person but still be a phony worshiper as I'm worshiping Jesus, God the Son? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. Absolutely, it's possible to do that. Look, this crowd as a whole was worshiping the right person, Jesus, the Lord God Almighty, which is very good. But they were worshiping him for all the wrong reasons, and that is ungodly. They weren't worshiping him for who he truly was. They weren't worshiping him because he is worthy. They weren't worshiping him because they loved him. No, they were doing all this not to glorify him, but to get something from him. They were doing this 
for themselves and for what he could do for them, not because he's worthy. And that's sinful. And look what happened. When Jesus didn't give them what they wanted, what their, when their expectations of him weren't met, when he didn't conquer the Romans like they wanted him to do, they turned on him in an instant. And as we've seen before, these same worshipers who were lining the streets on Palm Sunday, they were also the ones who were yelling, crucify him on Friday. And that proves how fake their worship really was. So yeah, it's possible to be fake worshipers of the true Christ. I'll worship him as long as he makes me happy and fulfills all my expectations for him in my life. Really? You know, that's so unbiblical. Because guess what? Hard times come. Sad times come. This happens all the time, by the way, today. False worshipers in the church who worship the right God, but for all the wrong reasons. Who aren't true worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth, but who are here for only what he can do for them. And it's no better than the fake worshipers in the crowd that day. So, Why do we worship Jesus? Here's why. It should be to glorify, honor, praise, exalt, and please God because we love him. Because he's worthy. And because we know and understand his great mercies towards sinners like us. And we love him all the more for it. Look at who he is and look at what he's done for us. Therefore, exalt him, glorify him, honor him, lift him high, passionately, lovingly, and from the heart. Because he alone is worthy as Lord God Almighty. And then look at what he's done for wretched old me. Therefore, I raise him high as the altogether lovely one that he is. Many people these days don't do that even as they go to church. This is a warning for us. Seventh, look, Jesus went into the temple, looked around, and then went into Bethany. Isn't that interesting? Now's the time to lead the people in victory as the Messiah. But he basically did the opposite. And that had to have the crowds wondering. Uh, He's he's sure not acting like we thought the Messiah would act uh, after recognizing him as the Messiah. So what was Jesus doing? He was planning a strategy for the next day. Look, he went down the Mount of Olives. He went past the Garden of Gethsemane. He went down into the Kidron Valley and then back up to Jerusalem into the temple. And he looked around. What did he see? He saw a beautiful building. He saw the priests carrying out their rituals there in the temple. He saw the people bringing sacrifices to the priests. But as a whole, he saw empty ritual that was void of true worship. See, there's a lot of false worship going on in Jerusalem that day. From the people on the Mount of Olives down to the priests in the temple. A lot of fake worship that went through the motions, but that was empty in heart. And notice this, the Lord of glory had visited his house that day and the people were basically ignorant of his presence. They're going through all the religious motions, but they had no room for the one true God in their hearts. Let me just jump ahead to what happened Monday, the next day. Mark 11, 15 through 17, if you want to look there. Mark 11, this happened on Monday. Mark eleven fifteen. look. They came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He would not allow anyone to carry the wares through the temple. Then he taught saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but You've made it a den of thieves. So look, on Palm Sunday, Jesus came into the temple. He looked around and made his appraisal of the horrific corruptions of the temple religion at that time. And then on Sunday, he went back up to his friends in Bethany for the night where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus had lived. And then the next day, Monday, is when he came and cleansed the temple just as we read. Now remember, I want to look at that for just a second. The temple was the focal point of worship for the Jewish people. The temple area was divided into courts, and the outer courts stood on the lowest ground. 
The outer court of the temple was called the court of the Gentiles, and this is the closest that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, could get to the temple building itself. In this outer court was where the scribes held their debates, and it's also where the merchants and money changers transacted their business. As you move up and closer in, you came to the court of women. This is the closest that women could get to the Holy of Holies. And this court was where the temple treasury was at, where people donated their money. It's interesting to note that the court of women was the scene of many of the Lord's teachings. And it was here that Jesus sat and watched people casting in their alms. And therefore, it was here where he saw a widow give her two mites to the Lord. Moving up and closer in was the court of the men of Israel. And then after that, you came to the court of priests, which surrounded the temple building itself. In this court of priests stood a huge altar of burnt offering and also the labor, labor for the priestly purifications. From here, 12 steps led from the court of the priests to the temple itself, the large building that contained the holy place and the holy of holies. Interestingly, at this time, the Ark of the Covenant was nowhere to be found. It's believed that the Ark of the Covenant was captured when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians in 586 BC. And since that time, no one knows where it's at. And just so you know, the Ark of the Covenant was basically a box that contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And it was a sign to the people of Israel that God was with them. The cover of the Ark of the Covenant was called the mercy seat and it represented the throne of God. But again, the ark was missing, and because it was missing, a stone was set in its place there in the Holy of Holies. The temple itself was visible from every part of the city, and it was here on Mount Moriah in the temple where the worship of God was centralized for the Jewish people. So think of what was taking place on that Monday, tomorrow, when Jesus goes into the temple area, the court of the Gentiles, and begins to drive out those who bought and sold in it. Think about that. Now, again, remember, this is the time of Passover where Jewish pilgrims came from all over the known world to celebrate the great Passover feast. And because of this coming celebration, the city would have been swarming with people. While in Jerusalem for the week of this feast, many of the Jewish people would go into the temple to pray, to offer sacrifices, and to perform religious rites, and to present their offerings in the treasury located there in the court of women. So people are everywhere. The city is probably four or five times larger than its normal size. And then think of this. The first real action that Jesus does as the newly crowned Messiah is offend everyone. Remember, these crowds wanted to take him by force and make him their king. Yesterday, Palm Sunday, right today, and they wanted Jesus to reign and to rule and to conquer, right? And if Jesus had been the Messiah that the people had wanted, he would have brought an army into Jerusalem and, and attacked the Roman fort there. But instead, alone and weaponless, Jesus attacked a group of his fellow countrymen. And again, he definitely had a different plan than they did. What's that? Not to reign, but to die. Not to be crowned, but to be crucified. Not to deliver Israel from the power of Rome, but to deliver sinful men and women from the power of sin. So he comes and he does the unexpected. Jesus walks into the court of the Gentiles, the outer court of the temple area, and he's sickened by what he sees. Oh yes, he saw it going on there the day before Palm Sunday, and things haven't changed since then, and he can't handle the desecration that's happening to God's temple. Now remember, the temple was supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, and that's a quote from Isaiah 56, verse 7. In other words, the temple was supposed to be a place of worship. Like the church is supposed to be a place of worship. It's supposed to be a place of quiet meditation, contemplation, praise, and devotion. It was supposed to be a place where God's people could draw closer to him and worship, sacrifice, and offering. It was supposed to be a place where God's people could seek his will and his blessing. A place where God would be exalted and glorified. A God-centered place and definitely not a man-centered place. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. Where the one you're praying to is central. And while we know that God is much bigger than a temple, the temple was a good picture to the people that God was indeed in their midst. Come to find out. The temple had become anything but a house of prayer for all nations. Instead, it had become a den of thieves. 
When Jesus says this, he's quoting Jeremiah 7, 11, when Jeremiah warned the people against hypocritical worship of God. Well, just as it was true in Jeremiah's time, so it wasn't true here in Jesus' time, and so is it true in our time. Look, worshipers of God at this time needed to obtain unblemished animals for sacrifice, as well as the annual requirement that every male Israelite pay half of a shekel for the temple tax. And it was out of these needs that the corruption grew. And as Jesus enters into the outer courts of the temple, the court of the Gentiles, there are thousands of Jewish worshipers interspersed with the Gentiles. And for a number of years up to this point, this area had become much like a religious marketplace. See, Annas, who was the high priest, was a corrupt man. Think about that, the high priest. He was a corrupt man who saw the temple and his position as a way to exalt himself as a way to become wealthy and as a way to be applauded in the eyes of men. So merchants would pay rights to a concession stand. Think of that. A concession stand where they could sell animals for sacrifice and also where they could sell wine and oil and salt and also where they could exchange money in proper currency and denominations for the people's temple offerings and taxes. And so these small businesses would pay the fee and then they would also have to pay a certain percentage of their profits to the high priest Annas. It's like a mafia. You think God was pleased with that? This is all done in the outer courts of the house of prayer, the temple of God. But here's the thing. This wasn't a mall. And the temple wasn't meant to be a marketplace, a stockyard or a bank where crooks and con artists carried out their greedy businesses under the appearance of serving and worshiping God. But look, on top of their regular sacrifices, these people were were leading up to the Passover celebration. And so for them that week, they needed to come into town and acquire their lambs for the Passover celebration. And these animals had to be approved by the priests who offered them up. And as people came in from out of town, think of this, they would usually have to purchase these animals to be sacrificed by the priest. However, the chief priests made sure that animals not bought in one of their franchises would be judged as unacceptable. And come to find out, it was a big fraudulent money-making scheme. Even worse, the price was hiked up to 10 times what the animal was worth, and many people couldn't do anything about it. Big business, see. And then to top that off, the people who had to have their money exchanged in the exact amount of their offerings to God, they were charged a 25% fee, and there wasn't a lot that the people could do about it. Once again, you think God was pleased with what was happening in the house of prayer? And this is sick. This is bad. This is highly ungodly. The temple had become a marketplace for thieves. It's now a place where God was exploited for personal gain. It was a place where God was used for money. Think about it. A Gentile would go into the court of the Gentiles in the temple of Jesus' day, and what would he see? Was it a place of worship? Was it, uh, uh, would he see people praying earnestly to God? Would he look around and wonder what's missing in his life? Would he look around and desire to know more about the God that's being glorified in the temple right there? No. Instead, he'd see a madhouse. He'd see fraud. He'd see swindlers. He'd see people lying and cheating and stealing for personal gain. He'd see a lot of man-centered and selfish people. He'd see religious abuse and a bunch of hypocritical hucksters. And he would walk away and discuss. I don't want anything to do with that. People missed it. Again, sadly, like much in the church today. A high priest... The priests, the religious leaders, the money changers, the shopkeepers, they missed it. What about worship? What about living for the honor of God? What about hating their sinful behavior? What about loving their neighbor as themselves? What about true faith that's lived out? Long gone. So Jesus reacts. Picture it. Jesus begins to drive out those who bought and sold. He also knocked over the tables of the money changers and the seats of the animal sellers. Jesus then allowed no one to carry anything through the temple. I mean, it's an incredible scene. Jesus made a shambles of the bazaar and he shamed those who were profaning it. 
the business scam comes to an immediate halt. The whole area is now in disarray. Confusion is everywhere. Animals are running around everywhere. Doves are flying every which way. And money of all kinds is rolling across the courtyard. You imagine seeing that? This is righteous anger in action. The holiness of God is being mocked. And so Jesus struck out in defense of it, rightly so. And here, Jesus shows his divine hatred against sin by cleansing the house of prayer, the house of God, the temple where the worship of God was to be central. And this act will seal his fate. So on Sunday, as everyone is hailing him as their king, Jesus knew that tomorrow, Monday, after he offends the hypocrites and cleanses the temple, things would change very, very quickly. Friday, the cross, just a few days away. So be it. Question, why do you worship God? The prayer? That we're not like the fake worshipers in Jerusalem. All about self, using God for personal gain. Self-centered, not God-centered. The other day, I saw an interview with Kanye West. Kanye West says that he's done with God. Actually, he said he is God. He's done with God because he prayed for a few things and God didn't pull through for him. So he's done with God. See, to Kanye, he followed Jesus for all the wrong reasons. What can Jesus do for me? How will he make me happy and healthy and wealthy? How will he fit in and help my self-centered agenda? That is false worship. And look, when sinful expectations aren't met, well, I'll just kill him. I'll kill him. We worship God because he's worthy. Come on. We worship God because we love him regardless of how things turn out for us. When life is hard, even when bad things happen, even when our self-centered expectations aren't met, no matter, he's still worthy. And he still saved my soul from eternity in hell. He, Christ, is worthy no matter what. So we worship May we worship Jesus today in spirit and in truth because we love him for who he is and because we love him for what he's done for undeserving sinners like us. Anyone? That's why. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. May we love him and may we worship him from the heart, our amazing, saving, worthy, glorious God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Help us, O Lord, to be true worshipers, not fake, false worshipers. To be God-centered, not self-centered. To see you in all your glory. To see who you are and what you've done. And to be passionately affected by that every day of our lives. Lord, help us to not be like the crowd, but help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Because you are worthy and because we love you. Speak to our hearts. We lift you high. And I pray that we would greatly glorify and remember you this week leading up to Friday and then to Sunday. In Jesus' name, we ask your blessing on us now. Amen.